business leadership is a very interesting topic today and as entrepreneurs we always face different kind of challenges going from your background you are with the armed forces then you are with the corporates and then you worked with the government so how did you manage the transition as a leader a very old saying in the army is that there are no good units or bad units there are only good leaders or bad leaders so the onus is on the leadership to extract the best out of the people it's a very autocratic style of uh, sort of management it's a leadership is you 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 are fundamentally given good teams because the recruitment process is done by somebody else and there's a very rigorous uh, recruitment process moving to the corporate side you still have certain tools whereby you can uh, monitor performance you can reward good performance you can penalize bad performance but by and large it is a much more of a uh, 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 environment which is definitely not autocratic the third environment which is the government where uh, you have no uh, no tool to you can't sack a guy because he is permanently in service it's also an environment where the drivers are very very different because there is no material gain you can't you can't reward a government servant no matter how exceptionally he performs his salary will remain exactly the same so all three are different environments and they all have very different drivers uh, and and obviously trying an autocratic style in the government is not going to work trying a consensual style in the army is definitely not going to work so it has to be more of an adaptive style in terms of the the dna of the organization and the environment and the task at hand so you have been a startup ceo for three entities three corporate entities and according to you what should be the core role of a startup ceo to my mind the startup ceo's job description is in the term itself startup that's the job so i think the point is for a startup ceo the difference is that they have to give their commitment and figure out a way of how to get clarity people who seek a lot of clarity before giving commitment rarely make good startup ceos they may be great ceos for a steady state company but for startup uh, they have to know how to work in ambiguity but what i realized and which is true for startup ceos is the moment i gave my commitment clarity automatically came so i think for startup ceos fantastic that is the key so once the entrepreneur gets clarity on his role how does he grow further because a lot of times we have seen challenges in front of entrepreneurs that they were the reason for initiating and uh, giving birth to that enterprise after some time they become the reason why the enterprise is not growing further because they want to delegate the responsibility but they never want to part away with the authority so how does one overcome this type of a mindset where he shares not only the authority not only the responsibility with but also the authority so what what are your thoughts on that i think entrepreneurs who get married to their idea and who fall in love with their idea which they have created often times are the core reason for stifling that idea because once that idea has achieved a certain critical mass then it has to be allowed to flourish and a startup ceo or an entrepreneur ceo who started it may not be the best person to scale it or to flourish it the challenge is really in letting go entrepreneur or a startup ceo to remain excited he must continuously do startups so once he has taken a startup to a certain scale he has got to have some other startup which excites him brings him again to that you know tempo instead of saying that i am going to take this startup rocket all the way to the moon so if you want to be neil armstrong and light the fire of the rocket and land on the moon not going to happen how is your mindset to recruit the right type of people and then you are responsible for those people the top management at least and uh, can, do, is it wise to have people at the top recruited by you who are smarter than you but you should be in a position to control them how does it work uh, actually you have to make a lot of compromises on the people you hire why would a stud who is working for an mnc leave that and come to you when you are in a startup stage right why would he give up whatever he is doing and come and jump because after all just look at what you are working with you are firstly fundamentally working with a very small pull factor you can't afford to pay uh, the people you are looking for the top dollar you can't go to a b school and get day one recruitment because you are a startup you are a nobody if out of 10 startup hires even if one or two fire and they make some meaningful difference i think the ceo has done a fantastic job at at a strategic level few positions have to be very very strategic hr is a very strategic uh, position I, and i i truly believe that every startup ceo must invest a lot of time in each and every hire how how do you think competition should be handled the competition uh, so there is this term called competitive intelligence i don't know if you've heard of this term uh, competitive intelligence and a lot of people uh, confuse it with competitor intelligence 
I believe that the real competition for any entrepreneur is not necessarily going to come from a competitor. It will come from forces which they have not, like, I'll give you an example. If you remember, do you remember the Remington typewriter? Yes. Remington typewriter always thought brother typewriter was their competition. Japanese firm would make it cheaper and they would compete against brother. They never saw the PC coming. Can you imagine uh, if you are the, you know, sort of uh, owner of Remington typewriter, you are Remington typewriters, you already have every person who needs a PC as your captive customer. He is using a typewriter for God's sake, he has to move to a PC. And yet they never saw the PC coming as competition. So I think the real competition that a, a startup CEO has to be worried about or an entrepreneur has to be worried about is not the competitor. See, remember, a startup CEO's core trait has to be the ability to spot opportunities. That's why he's a startup CEO, right? So he must also have the ability to discern competition before he becomes a competitor. In many of the companies, I have seen that there are either conflicting team members or there are conflicting teams in the same organization. How does he still make them perform and achieve in spite of the shortcomings of no synergy amongst themselves? So, so long as team members trust each other's professional competence, they don't necessarily have to like each other. And I think this um, sort of turning it on a paradigm to say that if I have a team of 20 people, it's not that they have to you know, spend their time hugging each other or you know, loving each other. That's not the aim. The aim is that they must have mutual respect for each other's ability and they must trust each other on each other's capability. So long as there is that speed of trust which happens within a team. And when I say trust, it doesn't mean I like you. So once a team achieves the speed of trust, then they start forging together as a team and achieving results. And I found that the best way to forge a team together is to put an ambitious goal out there. If that is somehow explained and, and articulated, my sense is teams don't have to like each other to work efficiently. Their working efficiently will make them like each other. How important is strategy for growth? And if it is important, when you make a strategy, how does one ratify that strategy? So when a strategic plan is being made, a great deal of time has to be spent to articulate what is it that you want. Very often that articulation is not done. It is done that ready, fire and then we lane. You know? So this concept of first working on what is it that you desire and fleshing it out, looking at its implications and then going on a plan. And once a plan is frozen, then going on pure and simple execution. So what should be the uh, monitoring mechanism of a business entrepreneur? so that it doesn't hit his company in a negative way? So I think the first uh, understanding that any entrepreneur CEO should have is that the love and the passion and the, you know, sort of attachment that he has to his company, he has to recognize, she has to recognize that his rank and file will not have that. Call your own office and see the response that you get as if you were a customer. And that will tell you a lot more about your organization than the PowerPoint presentation that these guys keep showing. You know, all these department heads will keep showing everything is hunky-dory, all is good and everything. Call your own office and you'll realize if your call is being picked up in the 17th ring and you say, I want this product, then say, minute, put you on hold, pata karta on this, that, or kal phone karna. Then you realize that the process belief that you have is actually not a true belief. And, and it is, it's a fact of life. It's a fact of life that the pristinity with which you take pride in creating something, will deteriorate as it goes down. The challenge of the CEO is to make sure that it does not deteriorate to an unacceptable degree. So I know a couple of entrepreneurs who say, why expansion should happen? I am achieving uh, this level of satisfaction now. Adding more to the expansion will add more to my troubles and take away peace from me. So why should I expand? So how do you motivate such entrepreneurs? That's why I asked, why should I expand? So it's a good question and the answer is there in the question that the moment an entrepreneur decides that this is enough and I don't want to grow anymore, he has just signed out of the entrepreneur club. Unless the organization that the person is responsible for is constantly growing, he doesn't qualify to, because by definition the entrepreneur word means that you will pursue enterprise. What I want to drive as a point is each person today needs funds for expansion needs funds for survival. He needs to keep making presentations to different organizations. It might be a banker, it might be a private equity holder, a supporter, it might be anybody. You need to do a presentation and you need to convince the other guy 
why you need the money and the person needs to believe in you that you are going to take away 100 rupees from him and multiply and give it back to him so what are your tips in such a situation so um so let's let's just step back a little bit and and basically address this question in a different way which i think will be a broader way of addressing it is the how does a person sell because after all when you're seeking funds also you're selling now there i i believe that in any kind of a sale there are in any organization itself in one single organization itself in one single sale itself there are four kinds of people you are selling to so there will always be a person who is the economic buyer and that economic buyer is the person who decides that for this 100 rupees investment i am okay with 120% returns or i am okay with returns of nothing but a feel good factor in terms of csr because the valuation may not necessarily be in money it could be in various other things right but he is the economic buyer there is a champion in the champion buyer in the organization who wants to champion that cause not necessarily from you he may champion that cause and the person may end up buying somebody else's your competitor stuff but he will champion that cause the third buyer is a technical buyer the technical buyer will always try to demonstrate how much he understands about that thing and it's most of a more of a technical head button it is got nothing to do he doesn't have the economic cloud he doesn't necessarily believe in it but he is a technical buyer whom you have to get on your side and convince that yes from a technology point of view or from state of art point of view your idea is better all these four avatars will be found there and i think ceos need to make a distinction of the pitch to each one of them if the sales guy wonders why did i fail then the answer lies in two mistakes that we make first mistake we make is we believe that the decision maker has the same decision making cycle as we have not true not necessarily true uh, definitely not true the second mistake we make is we have one canned pitch that we carry to each and every decision the same 83 slides in the same sequence which will be carried to everybody whereas that is really not the requirement some people like broad brush strokes they like ambitious plans some people want granularity they want how each milestone will be dealt with they want execution details to that level i think orienting the sale to the recipients or listeners decision making cycle is a far more successful way than dressing it up and flowering it up and you know padding it up in any other way fantastic i think we should all uh, give a round of applause